I invite you to open up your copy of God's perfect and precious word this morning to 1 Peter chapter 5. As you do so, let me say uh, I'm thankful to uh, President Aiken and uh, Dean Ashford for having me here with you. When uh, I want to be hopeful about the future of the Southern Baptist Convention, I think about places like Southeastern Seminary. It is a great privilege of mine to be on the faculty of Southern Seminary, but I want you to know how uh, much of a cheerleader you have in me about what God is doing here. Uh, I could spend the whole time talking about uh, contributions that your faculty have made to my own thinking and uh, how they've helped me, but I do want to say this because I have an opportunity to do it publicly uh, for one of the first times, and that is that I want in my life to be a faithful minister of the gospel. I want to be a faithful husband and father. I want to be a faithful scholar. And I don't want to neglect any of those things. Uh, and the best example I know of that anywhere in the world is Dr. Aiken. So I want to thank you for the influence that you've had on my life over the years. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1-4. through 4. I want to invite you to stand in reverence for the reading of the perfect words of our sovereign God. 1 Peter 5, beginning in verse 1. So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Let's pray. Lord, I am so thankful that you have ordained this moment. Lord, I am thankful that you, the chief shepherd, speak to your people. And you do so through your word. Lord, help me to be a faithful shepherd, knowing that if I am, you will own these words, not as the words of men, but as the very words of God. Oh, Lord, help your people to hear your voice. Shape us. Mold us. Help us to live our lives in light of the gospel and the logic it is to produce in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I had finally arrived. I was exhausted. It was the end of a nine-hour drive. Two weeks earlier, I had had knee surgery, and I had a car that was jammed packed with 35 boxes of books. My church had graciously granted me a sabbatical to go away a month and a family that I knew had graciously given me a beautiful lake cabin to stay in in Lake Martin, Alabama. So there I was. I'd finally gotten there. I had very specific instructions. And those instructions said that the address of the street that I was to get to, the number was 85. When I got there, there would be a circular drive. In that circular drive, there would be planters out front. There would be uh, one particular on the right that was a dead planter, and under that dead planter there would be the key. I would take that key, I would unlock the lake cabin, I would go in and it would be mine for a month. Well, I'd already gotten a little bit turned around, and uh, as a resident of Alabama, it shouldn't have surprised me, I pulled up in somebody's uh, 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 yard area, and the next thing I knew there was a tap on the window and a gun was pointed at me and said, what are you doing in my yard? Uh, nothing, I'll leave right now, I'm a pastor, please let me go. And, and so I left, and I finally found the street, so I got here, I was exhausted, and so I went in the lake cabin, I got something to eat out of the refrigerator, I looked and said, man, this place is amazing. And I walked around, there's a hot tub, my knee was killing me, I'm turning on the water, getting the hot tub ready, I bring my books in, I move all my stuff in, I start setting things up. And I noticed something that struck me. 
And that is that on the counter in the lake cabin, there was an Alabama football magazine. Well, the family that let me use their lake cabin are huge Auburn fans. If you know anything about Alabama or Auburn, there's a problem here. I began thinking, well, they must share it with other people. Then I walked around the lake cabin a little bit more, and I began to notice there are no pictures of the family that let me use this lake cabin on the wall. Well, it must be, must be a co-op. They must share it. But, it. but I decided I've got to find a picture of them somewhere in this place. I began running around looking at the walls, and finally... I started to get panicky. I drove back out to the end of the road. I shined the light on the address. And I was in 65, not 85. I called the person to verify. And they said, oh my word, that's not a vacation home. They live there all the time. And so here I am, I'm back at the lake place, I'm hobbling after Easter. I'm loading those boxes back up. And then I start thinking to myself, if they drive up, I'm loading 35 boxes into a car. (laughs) Finally, I got out of there. I got over to the other place. I got to the uh, right lake cabin. My heart's beating. I pull my stuff out. I feel like I'm going to pass out. And then all of a sudden, I remember I have medication and knee patches that I left in the other house. So I case it out like a criminal, and I break back in and steal my medication with my name on it. I go back over to the place and I'm finally there and I'm thinking, man, I got there and I thought I was in the right place. In fact, I started to feel welcome. I started to feel as though I was getting comfortable in that place when actually I was an an imposter. Now, my family vacationed in that same lake cabin this year, and every time I drove the jet ski behind those people and waved at them in their home, I couldn't help but to laugh. (laughs) I was an imposter, and I thought that everything was okay. I was comfortable. Here's what I fear. I fear that there are men who drive up to buildings every day, And as they drive up to that building, they park in a particular space, and that space is marked pastor. And they walk into that building, and they go to an office, and on the door of that office, it says pastor. And they hand out business cards to people, and on the business card, it says their name, and it says pastor. And they, when they hear somebody say pastor, they jerk their head around. But what they do has very little to do with what the Bible calls us to do in shepherding the flock. I fear there are far too many ministry imposters, well-intentioned, who do many good things, but we are called to do gospel things, who start becoming caretakers of the congregational status quo rather than gospel leaders and gospel agitators who start functioning as ceremonial pastors who end up co-opting the words of the revolutionary Jesus to keep the congregational peace or to climb the ecclesial ladder. Let me be very clear today. Jesus has no interest in being the subcontractor in any of our kingdom building projects. None. No interest in it whatsoever. This amazing letter here that we call 1 Peter is a call to live every single aspect of our lives based on the logic of the gospel. In fact, it starts out with some very strange words. There's a very strange title elect exiles it's written to elect exiles chosen to be strangers chosen by God to be refugees very strange combination of words we dull we get dull to words that ought to shake us words like crucified messiah 
Do you understand how strange those words are? Crucifixion, the mark of being cursed by God. Messiah, the anointed one, the king. Crucified Messiah? Foolishness to the world, but to us the wisdom of God. Elect exiles? Chosen to be wanderers? Chosen to be strangers? Chosen to be refugees? First Peter is arguing that these elect exiles in Christ are to see their life as a life of privilege. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3, verse 3 down through verse 12, there is one long run-on sentence in the Greek of explosive praise of the great privilege that we have as followers of Jesus to live as elect exiles in the world. These Christians were spread out throughout Asia Minor, the far fringes of the, of the Roman Empire, but they are to see themselves primarily as God's own people. Privileged. A part of a story. You see, 1 Peter keeps quoting Old Testament or bringing Old Testament in- imagery into the text. He is reminding them that you in Christ are infused into the story of redemptive history. The faith did not start with you. This is what God has been doing all along. There is a beginning and there is a glorious consummation in the end. That story in redemptive history centers on the person and work of Jesus Christ. And all of the story that centers on Christ is oriented toward eschatological fulfillment in the kingdom of Christ. There is a coming day of glory when the kingdom is consummated. You're placed in that story and you are to see your life in light of it. Pastor Jeremy Haskins, who's with me today, adopted a couple of boys from Ethiopia. Now, he's a redneck from Lewisburg, Tennessee. And it warms my heart to see those two boys who first came home wearing Atlanta Braves hats, didn't know what the Atlanta Braves were, and now these boys that were formerly Ethiopian, who are now Haskins, infused into the the Haskins story, they wear their hats up with a little bit cocked to the side, They say, what's up, y'all? One of them recently checked out from the library at school a book about Dale Earnhardt Sr. You see, their story has been redefined by his redneck life. Our stories are redefined by the gospel. We fit in redemptive history. In light of the grace of God and the personal work of Jesus Christ. And the end of the story is glory. It is fulfillment in the kingdom of Christ. That is the logic of the gospel. By the way, that's the way you have to interpret the Bible. Let's just take a quick example. You come to the Bible, the Bible says do not commit adultery. You get up and you say, you abstract that from the biblical story. and You say don't commit adultery. God doesn't want you to commit adultery. If you commit adultery, that's bad. It's unrighteous. God will judge you. All those things are true. But there's more that needs to be said. Because if you have not committed adultery, then you can walk away from that sermon and say, look at me, I haven't committed adultery, I'm okay. If you have committed adultery, you say, look at me, there's no hope for me, I've committed adultery, this is nothing but despair. God wants to push both those people in the opposite direction. Oh, you haven't committed adultery? But do not think that you do not have the root of adultery in your lustful heart. Your story needs to be defined by grace, not your morality. Oh, you have committed adultery? Marriage is to be a picture of the relationship between Christ and the church. I've got good news for you. If you look to Jesus by faith and repentance, Christ died for adulterers too. He is the perfect groom. And there's forgiveness for you. But here's what I want you to see. The same is true with your life. If you jump, jump straight to the, from the biblical text to, to, to your life, you're going to make tons of errors. But if you jump straight from the circumstance you're facing to your life, there are equal errors. You're going to get it wrong. Here's what most of us do. We have Jesus, not at the center, somewhere over here, and we've already decided that we know what should happen that is good, the original sin. We think we can decide what's good rather than allowing God to define it. 
we think we know what's good. So we try to co-op Jesus for what we know is good. And Jesus says, count me out. We're frustrated that things aren't going the way we know they should go. But Jesus is right and we are wrong. You see, when you live your life in light of the logic of the gospel, you view yourself in light of the gospel. Think about this with me for just a moment. Your church sends out a missionary to another part of the world. You follow up and you check up on that missionary. And you say, how's it going? And they say, well, it's going, it's going okay. But they've got weird food here. I need you to ship me some good food from back home. I'm not eating any of this stuff. And they wear weird clothes. I need you to shop for me and send me some clothes. I'm not wearing that weird stuff. And they like to do weird things. I need somehow, some way to get to a satellite where I can watch the things that normal people watch. And you say, whoa, we sent you there as a missionary. We, we didn't send you there so you could sit in and, and, and declare your rights in the midst of that context. We sent you there to declare the gospel, which often means a submission of your rights for the sake of gospel good. And Peter says, elect exiles, that is how you are to think about your everyday life. There are all kinds of things, he says, listen... You've got preferences, but the gospel matters more. Keep the gospel in its right place. Lead missional lives. You know, in our culture, we're moving more and more to where Christianity is on the cultural margins instead of the cultural seats of power. You know what they call that historically? Normal. Normal. Christianity has done incredible things from the cultural margins, clinging to the gospel more than anything else. Because our lives are to be defined by the gospel story. And what the case that Peter is making is that when your life is defined by the gospel story, then you see everything in light of the gospel. That means that the gospel story, gospel logic teaches us that suffering is not a rejection of God's purposes, but suffering rather leads to glory. You do know that there's a cross at the center of our faith, don't you? There's a crucified Messiah, which is good news for elect exiles. Let let me give you a quick summary of some of that logic. In in chapter 1, there's a section that deals with defining your life in light of the gospel story. It says in chapter 1, verse 7 that we go through various trials that were tested by fire, but it says at the end of verse 7, that we may be found to result in praise and glory at the honor of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Suffering leads to glory. Verses 10 and 11, he talks about the prophets, and he talks about, uh, verse 11, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Christ defines our life. The logic of the life of Christ is that he is, his, uh, his suffering led to subsequent glories. The logic that we are to see our lives in light of is suffering leads to glory. He goes on in chapter 2 and chapter 3 to apply that to everyday living. You may be in an unjust situation. You may have some authority over you that you don't like. Will you still embrace the gospel as central? And you believe that if you, if you endure in faith, keeping the gospel the primary thing, that, that God is able to work for good, that God is able to glorify himself. The same thing in a home with the example of a, of a wife with an unbelieving husband. The same thing in the church at the end of the section. Just look with me beginning at verse, uh, look with me beginning at verse 19. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit, the word means fame or glory, 
For what glory is it when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you've been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example and an outline, a pattern, so that you might follow in his steps. He who committed no sin... Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Literally, he handed himself over to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins, our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you were healed. For you were like straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. That's how you're to think about daily life. In the rind and grind of the daily life, you know this. You don't even understand what the good is. What the important is. The Bible keeps telling stories like there's a woman headed to a well. Nothing seems more routine than that. It was one of the most important things going on in the cosmos. It's recorded for us. In the midst of the daily grind in your life, you live that my life fits into redemptive history. That in Christ, even my sufferings matter for his glory and for my good. And the end of the story is the glorious consummation of his kingdom, eschatological glory. Well, he goes on to make the case and with Christians who suffer, he says this in chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Do you see the logic? You see, it's only when we see the logic, when we see how it unfolds, that we're to set up understanding what he says to pastors in chapter 5. If suffering leads to glory, if this is the logic of the gospel, where our lives are placed in the midst of, the most reasonable thing in the world is that the leaders of the churches will be leaders in living the logic of the gospel. That's what he calls us to here. In chapter 5, verse 1, he calls us to cruciform witness. Look with me. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Immediately, immediately you hear sufferings. You've been reading this book or you've been hearing it. Immediately your mind goes to glory. Oh, sufferings, he's about to talk about glory. Sufferings lead to glory. I exhort the elders among you as fellow elders and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker or a sharer in the glory that is going to be revealed. He says, I come to you not just as an apostle, but as a fellow elder, as a leader in the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am a sharer in his sufferings. I am a witness to his sufferings. Now, he wasn't at the crucifixion but he is a witness of the sufferings of Christ in that he is one who bears witness to the sufferings of Christ. He is the one who proclaims the sufferings of Christ. He is the one who presents in his body by following Christ, taking up his cross and following him. He leads the churches in presenting the sufferings of Christ to the world. But he says, understand this, as witnesses of Christ... We are also partakers of his glory. You know, a lot of guys are strong in the pulpit on Sunday. And they sabotage their own sermons in the hallways Monday through Saturday. Do you understand what whining and complaining is? It's false proclamation. It's false preaching. It is speaking as if the gospel is not true. A witness to the sufferings of Christ, a pastor ought to be that guy within a congregation who more than anybody else sees it and lives it and bears witness to the logic of the gospel and the sufferings of Jesus Christ. And I can tell you how to develop a strategic ministry plan. Look around your church and ask, what is least in line with the gospel in this congregation? 
you've got your strategic ministry plan. That's how you witness, bear witness to the sufferings of Christ. You apply the gospel and the community where God has placed you. Let me give one example of that. Our churches are still largely segregated. Makes no sense based on what Ephesians 2 says, that reconciliation is not only between God and man, but between man and man. So Gentiles and Jews, and Jews would look at Gentiles and think Gentile dog, and Gentiles would look at Jews and say, I despise you, you despise me. And now he says, in light of the gospel, that Jesus Christ killed that hostility. And now they're one new man. Talked to a guy, he's been in a church about 10 years. It's a completely segregated community. And he said, you know, I just don't know what to focus on in the church. I said, I do. Tear down that wall in the name of Jesus Christ. Tear it down. Uh, but but you, I, I might get fired. Well, here's my pastoral counsel to you. So what? So what? You see... If you want a ministry handbook that says the hired hand handbook to ministry, it says make every decision with your paycheck in mind. Years ago, I decided I'm going to be liberated from that. Before my feet hit the floor every morning, what I pray to God is this, God, I am perfectly willing to be fired today for the sake of the gospel. It's liberating. Now, there's nothing noble about getting fired for being a jerk. But for the sake of the gospel, not a hired hand, a shepherd. And that's what he goes to next, cruciform shepherding. Look at verses 2 through 3. He says, shepherd the flock of God. Isn't that ironic that it's Peter urging this here? Peter? He's at the crucifixion? No, he's not. Because they said, oh, aren't you associated with him? I do not know the man. But Jesus graciously comes to him and says, shepherd my sheep. And now he's pleading, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly. In other words, because you long to, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Now that not shameful gain, it's probably a reference to money. But also the word can be used for reputation, prestige, acceptance. Shepherd the flock. Don't try to build a name for yourself. And by the way, shepherds exercised authority. God is called shepherd. There are faithful shepherds and unfaithful shepherds. Unfaithful shepherds, Ezekiel 34. They feed themselves and not the flock. They scatter and do not pursue the flock. They protect themselves. They lord over them with severity. They're Pharaoh-like shepherds. And then Ezekiel 34 reverses it out and says, okay, the shepherds are unfaithful. I, the shepherd, will. I will feed you. I will gather you. I will protect you. I will care for you. I will give myself for you. Do you know at the very end it says, God is going to bring my servant David. But if you know your Bible, David's dead. Oh yeah, but the one who sits on the throne of David is yet to come. John 10, the good shepherd, or probably best, the model shepherd. And guess what he is? He's not a hiring hand that will run away. He lays down his life for the sheep. And then he tells us, shepherd the flock. You see, there's a problem with your shepherding if you are so self-interested that you lord over and severely treat your people and just whip them. But equally problematic is that you're so self-interested that all you do is pacify and coddle them. It's not what a shepherd does. I had a young man who I recommended to a church. It was uh, two years. He'd been there. He called me. He said, I've got a problem. So, okay, what is it? He said, I've, I think it's time for me to move on. I said, really? Why? What's going on? He said, well... I've I put out some ideas there, and I've got some deacons that are opposing me. So I'm waiting. Yeah, well, you know, what's going on? So, well, that's the problem. I said, that's why you're there. If they just did everything normally in line with the logic of the gospel, they wouldn't need you. You're the shepherd. You're not only willing to go that, you're willing to give your life. I said, you, you call me like somebody who opened a restaurant and called me and say, I've got a problem. I said, what? People keep coming here expecting me to feed them. Well, of course they do. 
had another church call me. I was working with them through some conflict. Past, a great pastor had left, and now some liberals were trying to, small group of liberals trying to wrest control of the church. And uh, I was working them through it, and they called me. And they said, listen, we're, just, we're not going to go through this. We're just going to go start a church in a strip mall and let them have this. I said, if you do, I will pray every day that your new congregation fails. Because if you don't love the church you're in enough to be willing to fight for it, why do I want you to have another one? Pastor, it may be that the conflict you're going through is the reason you're there. Cruciform shepherding. We believe that suffering leads to glory. Finally, cruciform hope. I just want to make one more point for you out of verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading fading crown of life. The chief shepherd. You're under his authority. And in fact, you stand as a reminder of glory, a reminder of what's coming. Your presence there is an eschatological promise. You see, the Bible says that in the end, Revelation 7, 6, 17, for the lamb in the midst of the throne will be your shepherd. Revelation 22, 4, they will see his face. Here you stand, not trusting in your ability, not trusting in your amazing gifts. We overvalue that stuff. But the providence of God has placed your presence there. And you speak the words of God, and God shepherds his people. And they look at you and they're reminded that there is one day when we will be in the presence of the chief shepherd. There is coming a day when we will not just see that face, we will see his face. We undervalue providence and presence. We overvalue gifting. Loving Jesus from your gut relentlessly applying the gospel, relentlessly living based on the logic of the gospel, a self-sacrificial gospel leader and gospel agitator in the community. By the way, that's what mentoring is. It's calling guys beside you and saying, hey, listen, let's think about what it means to live in light of the logic of the gospel. Let's see everything in light of redemptive history, the person and work of Christ, and eschatological glory. Let's be honest, it's easy to fake it. Eugene Peterson is right in working the angels when he said we can learn a, a few tricks of the trade and we can fool the people. But it's empty life. I have the privilege to pastor a church where many of the people in the church far exceed me in living the logic of the gospel. One story. A man in my church is about 70 years old now. His health is failing. He called me one night. This was about eight years ago. He said, Pastor, I need you to come over to my house. My daughter's live-in boyfriend just shot her and killed her in the presence of my grandchildren. And he shot himself. And I thought, okay. And I'm over there thinking, what am I going to say to him? And he opens the door and he says, Pastor, I'm so glad you're here. The reason I wanted you to come is that we're praying that my daughter's boyfriend will live because I want to tell him about Jesus. And he wept and prayed that he would live. Now he wanted justice to be done, but he also wanted to be in heaven with him forever. That is not cotton candy Jesus talk. That is a life that's crucified to Christ. He no longer lives, but Christ is living in him. He was determined in the hardest moment to know nothing among anyone but Jesus Christ and him crucified. If you're present and the providence of God gives you a pulpit, lead in that way. A lot of us need to take our ministry plans and all of our grandiose ideas, throw them in the trash can. Just lead people to follow Jesus. Crucify your ministry plan. Let's pray. Lord, give us wisdom to apply these glorious gospel truths to our lives. May we believe the logic of the gospel and that in Christ suffering leads to glory. Thank you for the privilege of being elect exiles. One day we will see your face. In Jesus' name, amen.